Good morning, dear saints, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today's Wednesday, July 3rd, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the Holy Scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Our topic for today is Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 26. Jesus performs two profound miracles that, of course, reveal his divine power and his compassion. First, he heals a man covered with leprosy, touching him and instantly making him clean. But despite instructing him to keep it quiet, news spreads rapidly. Next, while teaching in a crowded house, some men lower their paralyzed friend through the roof to reach Jesus. And seeing their faith, Jesus forgives the man's sins which, as you might imagine, provokes outrage among the religious leaders. To demonstrate his authority, he then heals the man, who then rises, picks up his mat, and walks home, leaving everyone in awe and glorifying God. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this morning as we read the Bible verse by verse, uncovering the profound truths of God's Word. We're here for you over the air, online, through that KFUO app, and you can also subscribe to the program using your favorite podcasting service. Thy Strong Word is also made possible in part by the good folks over at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Don't forget all the great work that they do for the kingdom, translating, publishing, and distributing faith-enriching resources for people around the world. Visit them online to see how they can help you with your outreach ministry at LHF Missions. As for me, I'm always happy to hear from listeners. I do strive to respond to your feedback. There's a couple ways you can get a hold of me. You can email me at pastorboo at gmail.com, or you can find me on Facebook. All right. Well, joining us this morning is a regular contributor to the show, the Reverend Roger Mullet. He's the pastor of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Buffalo, Wyoming. Brother, how is the weather out there in Buffalo, Wyoming? Staying pretty mild this week for (laughs) summertime. uh, Upper 60s, low 70s most of this week, which is just fine with me. Yeah, me too. We have like this beautiful like high of 60, low of, well, actually, no, our high I think is 82 today. But our low is 60, so we're doing pretty good in our 70s and 80s. So, yeah, we're pretty happy also. Well, I hope God's been blessing you since the last time we talked. Um, You know, here we are in Luke, uh, seeing some miracles of Jesus. Um, You know, I I like the Gospels. I mean, for besides the obvious reasons, because you just kind of see what life is like on the ground for Jesus and his early disciples. And I, I don't know. I mean, I think sometimes we naively think that we would be right there. But I think more often we'd be one of those ones in the crowd just trying to figure out what's going on. And even putting ourselves there in the crowd is is kind of a remarkable thing to do. And I think one of the reasons that the Gospels resonate with people so well, in addition to, of course, being the main thing that we hear week in and week out on Sunday morning, is for the most part, they're narratives, they're stories that we can kind of find ourselves in, whether we're putting ourselves in the shoes of the disciples, which in some cases is very appropriate to the story. In some cases, we are in the crowds on the sideline, kind of watching it all unfold. And in this case, you know, depending on our situation in life and the various things that we might be struggling with, we might find ourselves in the shoes of those who are bringing the paralyzed man before Jesus. And sometimes we might find ourselves lying on that mat with the paralyzed man. And I think those those kind of rich layers of details that the gospel writers give to us help us to kind of really grab onto those gospels in a way that, you know, the last time I was on, we were nearing the end of Proverbs. A lot of Proverbs Mm -hmm. and other things in the Old Testament, they're a little more abstract. They're a little harder to grab onto sometimes, but this is a, I mean, this is a story and we, we really resonate with stories. I think anytime we read a story, a narrative, we want to place ourselves somewhere. And, you know, if we're reading fiction, we, well, I I guess we most of the time put ourselves in the place of the protagonist, the hero. No one wants to be an ancillary character, but in the gospels, we have this, this beautiful uh, narrative. And as you said, um, we, we really are drawn to stories. And I think it also makes it easier for us to remember these events, share them with others. Um, I, I'm sure it's out there, but I don't know that I've ever seen any kind of 
preparation for evangelism that focused on storytelling because that's exactly how the gospel writers, you know, give us the message. It is. In fact, um, the text immediately preceding the text that we'll undertake today, Luke chapter 5, 1 to 11, was the gospel reading for this past Sunday uh, in the one-year lectionary. Uh, and so I, I actually preached about that a little bit in my sermon, that you know, when we, we do all these evangelism things, all of these programs, all of these you know five steps to this and four steps to that, um, but look at how Jesus catches fish. He just uses a net, no bait, no gimmicks, no tricks. He just catches everybody up and and gives them the word of God. Amen to that. Well, I tell you what, we have a lot to cover then, so let's go ahead and do it. But before we do any of that, would you go ahead and kick us off with a word of prayer? Let us pray. Gracious Lord Jesus, from the very beginning of your earthly ministry, you demonstrated your power to heal, your authority to forgive, your grace and mercy to save sinners for all eternity. Help us as we study your word to again realize, learn, appreciate, and give thanks for your care for us in body and in soul, and to look forward to that great and glorious day when you raise us from our graves, perfect our bodies, and welcome us into your kingdom which has no end. All this we ask in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, you know, last time we were here, we were talking about uh, Simon Peter and, you know, his declaration as he fell down at Jesus's feet, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And we, we talked about what, is that, what does that say about Simon Peter's understanding of who Jesus was? Um, I, I see here language where, you know, I don't want to be in the presence of God because of my sins kind of language, you know, like I's beginning of Isaiah kind of language. Um, you know, he's, he's getting there. He's getting close. He hasn't, he hasn't made that proud declaration of who Jesus is yet, but he he's, he's definitely acknowledging the uh, amazing and astonishing things that Jesus is able to do. And we're going to see that same theme of, uh, of falling down before Jesus as we read through these, but we're going to go ahead and start with verse 12. I'm going to read through 16. Here we go. Now, while Jesus was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and he begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and he touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he charged him to tell no one but Go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and be healed of their infirmities. But Jesus would draw, withdraw to desolate places and pray. Okay, so we, we, we see Jesus doing miracles. The word's getting out. This guy comes and he is full of leprosy um you know we don't you don't hear about leprosy anymore it's called hansen's disease today um you know certainly it still exists people still suffer from it but i don't think what we think of as hansen's disease it has the same connotation as it did back then or maybe it does I, I don't know open that up for us a little bit i think certainly uh softened in this day and age because medicine has advanced so far um of course, in, in the time of Jesus, when you run into someone with leprosy, um, there's, there's a lot more to it than just the disease. Now, the disease itself is bad enough. Um, your extremities usually, little by little, simply begin to die. Um, fingers and hands, feet, um, and eventually it is, it's, it's not quite a flesh-eating disease, but, but sort of. And um, the bigger problem, really, uh, if, if that wasn't bad enough, is that leprosy was very, very contagious. And at the time, there was no way to treat or cure it. And so if you had leprosy, you were not only diseased, but you were also something of a social outcast. You weren't able to live at home for fear of infecting your family with the same disease. In fact, even the clothing uh, that uh, lepers uh, war was subject to some extra layers of cleansing 
And when you kind of look through the Old Testament laws about lepers and how many degrees of separation there needed to be, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and so the healing then of leprosy, uh, which we see here, and we'll make some connections to another healing of lepers in uh, Luke chapter 17 here in a little bit. Um, the cleansing of leprosy is a miraculous uh, kind of, I mean, it, it is kind of recognized as a work of God, uh, not anything that a human physician would be able to do, or I should say a merely human physician. Uh, but then also, in addition to the restoration of the flesh, there's also restoration of, of life. There's a restoration of relationship. You can go home. You can go back to work. You don't have to stay away from people anymore. And so leprosy, then, it's hard not to uh, connect it to sin. And indeed, we should. Um, it's a great image of sin throughout the Gospels. And that this man is full of leprosy, I think, just even strengthens that image that we are full of sin, that we are, according to our sins, going to die in the flesh, and that we are, according to our sins, separated from God. And so no human physician and no amount of human work can rid us of the leprosy that is sin. And so we have to find Jesus, or rather Jesus has to find us and, and cleanse us of that which separates us not only from God, uh, but also ruins relationships with family and friends and also uh, torments us even in our flesh that, that takes us ultimately to earthly death. And so we see a lot of nice parallels there. Um, we do want to be careful, of course, whenever we're, we're kind of allegorizing like that and saying, well, leprosy kind of paints us this picture of sin, to not overlook the fact that this really did happen in time and space, that there really was a man full of leprosy who really did come before Jesus and pray this great prayer, and that Jesus really did cleanse him and say these things. But I think we, looking back on it, particularly through the cross and the empty tomb, we can see both things, that this did happen in time and space. This was a real miraculous healing event. And it also speaks to us on a grander level, on a more spiritual level, and perhaps on an even more eternal level. You know, going back to just the mere disease, today leprosy is not considered particularly contagious. It is absolutely contagious, but not particularly contagious, as you said, because of treatments and, and hygiene and everything else. Back then, the reason for its, you know, extra contagiousness was because of the lack of hygiene and understanding of germs and that sort of thing. And, and you're right. People were ostracized from society, often often living together in, in communes uh, that actually that practice continued for a very long time. But then having so many people in close contact with each other obviously just spread more of the disease. It was awful. And for those at home to kind of understand the uncleanness part, uh, I would take you to Leviticus 13. I'm certainly not going to read all of this. In fact, it gets kind of gross, but I'm going to read just a few verses to give you an idea of, of kind of what's going on. Uh, 13 from Leviticus chapter one, uh, verse 1. Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When a person has on the skin of his body a swelling or an eruption or a spot, and it turns into a case of leprous disease on the skin of his body, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons the priests. And the priest shall examine the diseased area on the skin of his body. And if the hair in the diseased area has turned white and the disease appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it's a case of leprous disease. And when the priest examined him, he shall pronounce him unclean. But if the spot is white in the skin of his body and appears no deeper than the skin, then the hair is not turned white and the priest shall shut up the diseased person for seven days. It shall examine him on the seventh day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on for a lot. And there's a lot of different sort of um, rubrics by which the priest can, I guess, diagnose the person. Um, I think uh, the the importance of understanding, though, that it's not as though God is, I guess, against people who have illnesses. Uh, we're actually going to see that in this case. It's not the case at all. But I don't think it's a case of over-allegorizing to explain that in the same way that death and disease are the results of sin and can spread, um, I just want to highlight what you said. In the same way, sin is, is an infectious disease that can spread. We read in Paul in 1 Corinthians about how, hey, for those who are who are causing divisions in the church, 
uh, actually, I'm thinking more of the sexually immoral of the church. If there's no repentance, then that person, for the sake of himself, but also the sake of the whole church, needs to be swept out like like leaven on on over Passover. So I, I think you're right when you say um, he's full of leprosy. It's an odd construction. Uh, and then he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. So this isn't even a case of him going up and giving his heart to Jesus or commanding Jesus to come into his life. It's very much still all on Jesus. And I think it's a prayer that demonstrates the man's faith. Um, he calls him Lord, which is not necessarily a title for God. Um, this word in Greek is very generic for anybody who has authority over other people. Um, the master of the household, for example, could be called this. Um, but it is a recognition, I think, particularly in the latter half of his sentence. If you will, you can, you are able, you have the power to make me clean. And I think that's the recognition of who Jesus is and what he's able to do, if you will. And it is the hardest prayer to pray. It is the hardest one to truly pray in the Lord's Prayer. I think probably the hardest prayer to pray in the life of the Christian, thy will be done, if you will. If you wish, basically, is what this man's saying. Um, if you want to, you are able to do this. And it's a great confession, not only of who Jesus is, but also of, of again, that idea of thy will be done, that it doesn't ultimately matter to the leper uh, whether he lives or dies, because I think, I think this confesses his faith here, and he recognizes that his life, uh, his everything, is in God's hands and that it is left to God's will. And of course, Jesus stretches out his hand and, and does will that he should be cleansed. Uh, and that stretching out of his hand, um, even just the stretching out of the hand is a great Old Testament image for extending the power of God. And we talk about the hand of God, the finger of God, that's all over the Old Testament to demonstrate God's power in creation. Um, but then, of course, Jesus touches him, which is a big, big, big no-no. You do not touch somebody with leprosy because then you get leprosy. But of course, for Jesus, um, it works the opposite way. Normally, if you touch something that is unclean, it makes you unclean. Jesus undoes all of that when he fulfills the law for us. Uh, and his whole life of healing and ministry is simply this. He is perfect and holy and clean. And his perfect holiness, his cleansing uh, passes to other things. He reverses the flow, if you will. And immediately the leprosy leaves him. A couple of things, you know, yes, Jesus in this case doesn't say your faith has made you well, as he has in other cases. He emphasizes what the man said when he says, I will be clean. He acknowledges the faith of the man in this case through the submission to Christ's sovereignty um, and, and the touching him. Now, while you guys were uh, on the one year, we're preaching what just came before this. We were talking about on the three year. Uh, the woman with the flow of blood. And it's the same thing. She uh, commits a, a pretty bad social faux pas by being unclean herself and then going and touching a, a rabbi, really anybody, making them therefore unclean. Uh, and yet, of course, Jesus doesn't condemn her but acknowledges her faith. And I see that happening here too. But him reaching out and touching him is significant. Even this man in this case doesn't, boldly go touch the hem of Jesus's garment, but he expresses his faith in another way. And Jesus does what I imagine everybody around him was probably like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. But he does. And immediately the leprosy left him. Um, it's, it's, it's almost like, a, like an exorcism, right? Because it just goes away. And, and we know natural processes of healing the body but I get the connotation here that it was visibly immediate. Everybody around would have been able to say, this guy is healed. Unlike, say, the woman who, with the flow of blood, who kind of only knew herself that she had been healed. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the, the uh, I mean, just the reaching out and the touching is incredible uh, because it, it reminds us as well that this is, I mean, that we have a God, that we have a Lord who came into our lowly, sinful, unclean place 
and brought it on himself. Is the reading that uh, that those on the three year had this past Sunday? Is that the reading where Jesus says that he feels the power go out of him? Yeah, from Mark, right, chapter uh, five. Yeah. yeah, that's so great because when Jesus feels the power go out of him, it's that same power, right? If you will, you can. You have the power to make me clean. And so Jesus stretches out his hand and sends out that power to cleanse him. And it's the same thing with the woman who had the, the flow of blood, that he feels the power go out of him. And that has artistically been used to kind of demonstrate. And I think it's the same thing with that. Immediately the leprosy leaves him. We might think about when he heals uh, Peter's mother-in-law and he rebukes the fever and immediately the fever mm-hmm. leaves. Um, it's been it's been said kind of artistically that um, Jesus isn't really casting those things out necessarily, um, but that he's taking them on himself. That, as Isaiah says, he bore our infirmities and carried our diseases. I mean, that he actually, instead of uh, necessarily destroying them or making them just cease to exist, that he actually takes them on himself as part of the burden that he bears in our place, uh, which is just, I mean, an incredible, incredible image, I think. Yeah, that's something worth chewing on. I'm, I'm just kind of rolling it around in my head thinking, you know, it, Jesus does that which they all believed would make him instantly unclean and not just unclean in the ceremonial sense, but that he could actually contract this disease. But Jesus being you know, in control of all creation has no fear, reaches out. The leprosy immediately left him, but left unsaid is where does it go? <laughs> right. Um, and yeah, Jesus is taking these things on to himself. I, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say now Jesus is infected with leprosy. Uh, maybe you would, but I, I don't think I would say that. But I definitely see here Jesus uh, in his command of these things um, showing his ability to control them. So even if they did in a very literal way go into Jesus, he's still he's still Lord over those things. Yeah, of course. And as you mentioned in your introduction to the segment, uh, right, th- what these miracles also show us, even though it's not spelled all the way out, it's spelled out a little bit closer in the second portion of the passage that we'll do today. Um, that, that part of the miracles, a part of the purpose of the miracles, part of the thing that we learn from the miracles is that Jesus is Lord of all creation, uh, that he does have control over all these things, and he, he made it, so why shouldn't he? Jesus healing uh, Peter's uh, mother-in-law is another great example where outside her house, he heals all night. And the next day, there's more and more and more people. And so he says, you know what? I'm, I'm moving on. I, I, I got to go somewhere else. I'm not here to just put up a, a, a healing center. And, and we get that same kind of thought here in verse 14, just to hear it again. He charged the man to tell no one, but to go and show yourself to the priest, make an offering for your cleansing, uh, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. Two things stand out. One, of course, that yet again, Jesus says, don't go tell people. Now, of course, because we're all sinful, that's exactly what everybody tends to do. And I've I've heard people argue, and I don't know where you stand, that Jesus is being clever here with reverse psychology in order to try to get people to go out and spread it. I I don't accept that. I, 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 I don't know that I could even be convinced because, one, it's deceptive, but two, I think Jesus instead is is very clearly not wanting to become a sideshow. He's there for a different purpose. And the proof to them, the priests, as he goes, uh, assuming this guy's well known as being a, a leper, um, he's going now and saying, hey, I'm healed. And they're absolutely going to say, well, how did that happen? Yeah, I agree. Uh, it would be kind of clever. And it's kind of a clever little interpretation um, to say that this is reverse psychology. But if they, in fact, ran around and told everyone about Jesus and what he was doing up to this point, they would get the message wrong. And that's what you right. see. Another example of this is at the end of John chapter 6, after the feeding of the 5,000, where he's starting now to teach about these things. And he tells the crowds, look, you're only here because you know what I did with the bread, right? And that kind of becomes this little touch point for a few more chapters in John's gospel. That, that they're getting the wrong idea 
of who Jesus is and what he's doing. If we only focus on the miracles, we too will get the wrong idea. Um, we can we can kind of fall into that misinterpretation that like, well, look, Jesus heals diseases. So that's his whole that's his whole focus. So why isn't my disease being healed? Um, right. But these really, and that's why there's so few of them, I think on the grand scale, they're just little glimpses of what is to come, right? They're just little glimpses of what's going to happen when he finally uh, completes his work of salvation. And that's why he's telling him to go and show himself to the priest and to make the offering as Moses commanded, because in time and space, in a very, I mean, just a very simple chronological sense, the law has not yet been fulfilled in its entirety by Jesus' death. He's not done yet. The law still stands at this point. The ceremonial law still stands. Um, and we see little glimpses where Jesus is going to bend those rules a little to make a point and so on. But you, but here, right, for these Jews in this place, the Old Testament law stands. Jesus hasn't fulfilled it in its entirety. So this this particular thing about cleansing, it, it needs to be upheld. Um, and Jesus, you know, in Matthew 5, I have not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. It doesn't go away. The burden of keeping it uh, does. And that's and that's kind of what we see here as well. In case you guys at home were wondering, well, what does it look like when the guy goes back to the priests? Well, we find that in Leviticus 14. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall go out of the camp and the priest shall look. Then if the case of leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, then the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field. There's also some, uh, as you said earlier, he's shaving off his hair. He's washing his clothes in special ways. This lasts a week. It's a big ordeal. But, but you know, this guy is probably happy to do all of this. But more than that, he's happy to tell others exactly why or how he was healed. Yeah, you know, and I think that Jesus is trying to mitigate. It's not his time yet. And you're right. The message isn't just right yet. And that's why we see him in verse 16, withdrawing away, as he often does, to a desolate place and pray. Well, folks, we're going to have to withdraw away just for a few moments as we listen to these messages. But we're coming back. Don't worry. And when we come back, we're going to keep on going. Get into the next section where Jesus, well, he experiences a man who has faith through the roof. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today, it's the Reverend Roger Mullet, pastor of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Buffalo, Wyoming. Friends, don't forget, you can contact me at pastorboo at gmail.com or on Facebook with your questions, comments, and feedback. If you're able to get me those questions and comments before the end of the show and they're related to what we're talking about, I'll do my best to get them out on the air. So it's a great way to also ask my guests a question. And if it happens to be after the show, no worries. I'll either answer it myself or send it to my guest so that he can respond to you. But let's get right back into it because we're in an exciting moment here. Jesus has withdrawn away to a desolate place to pray. 
Jesus in prayer, and I don't want to skip this before we move on, but Jesus in prayer is a is an interesting combo because we know that God is one, that Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but we still see Jesus praying to his Father and often. And if the creator of the universe is in communion, prayerful communion with essentially himself, how much more should we be in prayer? And I, I got to tell you, I'll be honest, you know, right here on the air, it's one of my weak points is making time for prayer. Uh, I find myself praying a lot to God, but not in the, I think, in the focused solitude that we see Jesus doing it. Yeah, amen. <laughs> um, probably one of the things that would mirror the top of the list of struggles for most every Christian, I'd imagine. Um, and you're, you're exactly right. If Jesus withdraws to talk to the Father. I mean, if, if Jesus does that, um, how much more do we need to? And mm -hmm. uh, particularly in Luke's gospel, uh, do we see this happen, um, which is, I think, a really important um, kind of thing that Luke especially wants to emphasize, um, the prayer and the worship. And, and almost it's almost liturgical, really. Um, if you've never read Luke's gospel with like prayer and worship and that kind of theme in mind, give it a try. Um, it's, it's pretty neat to see uh, much more in Luke's gospel than, for example, in the other gospels. Um, but this, this withdrawing to desolate places to pray, I think one of the most remarkable times that Jesus does this is right before he names the 12, that he's got all of these people following him, and he goes and he prays right before he picks the 12. He talks to the Father. Uh, and, and, you know, in this case, yeah, he's very much setting an example for us as Christians. And I think even more so, uh, frankly, for us as pastors, uh, that if the chief shepherd spends time in private conversation with the Father in heaven, we who would be his under shepherds, who would serve in the stead and by the command, uh, we ought to be following that example as well. In, in all circumstances, uh, Paul says, pray without ceasing. Uh, I don't think he probably means that you should do literally nothing else in your entire <laughs> life except pray. Um, right. I don't think that's probably what that means, uh, but rather to pray in all circumstances, uh, to pray for yourself and for your family and pastors, most especially to pray for the people that God has given you to take care of on this side of heaven. Um, it, and to follow that example of Jesus. And, and when we don't know what to say, of course, we have the assurance that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us when the words just won't come. I like to compare it to the, maybe a phrase that would say, uh, well, go eat without ceasing, right? That, that means never cease eating because you'll die, but it doesn't mean sit around and eat all the time because then, well, then you'll die. But the idea that we are to be in constant communication with the Lord is also not a burden. It's a gift. I think we make it a burden because in our lives, we feel like so many other things should take precedence. And, and please don't think I'm being hypocritical because, folks, I, I'll give you a little inside baseball. You know, pastors are in the Bible a lot, but often for other people. And they're in prayer a lot, but often with and for other people. Um, and those things, are, of course, good, right, and salutary. But, yeah, even, even we pastors need to find these times to be in the, in the Word and in prayer for ourselves. But moving on, so I want to start with verse 17, and I think I'm, I don't want to split up the story. So I'm going to read all the way through 26, and then we'll come back to the top. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, and they let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And when Jesus perceived their hearts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk. But so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, go home. 
and immediately he rose before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. I, 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 I don't know which order you want to talk about it, but I just I feel like I have to start at the bottom real quick. You expect from being students of the Bible, we expect that the Pharisees and teachers are going to, by the end, use this to say, oh, yep, this guy's bad news. I, I kind of see here that at least at least some of them, I think, were probably in that crowd saying, wow, there is something about this guy. But I don't know. Going back up to the top, you have so many Pharisees, teachers of the law. They've come from all over so many that they're checking this Jesus out. I I think it might be a little improper for us to just attribute malice to every single person who happens to be a Pharisee or a teacher or a scribe. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. And I think that that last sentence, amazement seized them all. I mean, that probably doesn't necessarily mean every single person in the crowd, but it does say that. Um, and they glorified God and were filled. And I, I think I would land on and were filled with awe saying we've seen extraordinary things today. I think even if the Pharisees are going to begin to kind of put up a little bit of a veneer, if you will, of that, that malice and opposition to Jesus later in the gospels, I think here we see a little, maybe, maybe a little bit of a slip as they're trying to keep up that uh, kind of that facade or put on the brave face against, you know, Jesus who will turn out to be from their point of view, uh, rather a rebellious religious leader. Um, but they just kind of recognize how amazing it is that that happened. Um, I think they can be filled with awe about these friends who were so, so intent on getting this man to the feet of Jesus that they would come in through the roof. They're filled with awe that Jesus would, would dare to say your sins are forgiven. Uh, they're filled with awe at the way that he, he answered them with questions and made them think about what was really happening there. And of course, they're filled with awe that not only were the sins forgiven, but also this paralyzed man. Uh, we don't know how long he's been paralyzed, um, but it may be that he's been paralyzed his whole life, uh, that he now just rises up and picks up what he's got and goes home. Uh, that this man who hasn't walked in who knows how long, maybe ever, is able to just get up and walk. Uh, that 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 healing and that restoration of his body is so complete. We have seen extraordinary things today, um, and I think I think that's just the human reaction. That everything that we see in this in this section is just it really is incredible. There's so much packed in here uh, in just these what is it nine or ten verses. Mm -hmm. So he's teaching, uh, and let's let's start though with this idea of the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Um. It, Obviously, this is immediately following his withdrawal to desolate places to pray, but I don't want people to get the idea that somehow sometimes Jesus had that ability and sometimes he didn't, and this was just one of the cases where he had it. Um, we, we could confidently say that Jesus always has this. So why do you think that Luke is emphasizing this in this moment, do you, or have you thought about it? Well, it's the same word. Uh, as in the previous, when, when the leper says, you can make me clean, what he says in Greek is, you have the power to make me clean. Uh, and I, I wonder if there's meant to be a link there that, that we're really trying now to tie these things together, not only the cleansing of the leprosy, but now also the forgiveness of sins and also the healing of the man who is paralyzed. Um, and, and in this passage particularly, we're going to see a distinction uh, although it's not a it's not a strong distinction made here by Luke, um, but there is a distinction between power and authority, and and both of those words are used. They are distinct words in Greek as well. Uh, both of those words are used here, and I think that's an important thing as well. That the power of the Lord is with him to heal, but later on it's going to be the authority to forgive sins. And and just for folks at home for fun, by the way, the Greek word for power is dynamis, just like dynamite right so th th this is a power that comes from within and boy he really is kind of just lighting off a bomb when he says man your sins are forgiven you and jesus does this intentionally because well as we see a little later he can read he can perceive the thoughts of people so he says man your sins are forgiven this leads me to well, at least to the conclusion that in the same way that he can read the hearts of the pharisees 
he's clearly able to read the intentions and heart of these men who are lowering down their friend and even the friend. And I bring that up because I think some people struggle with the possibility that this man is forgiven because of his friend's faith. And that's not something that the Bible teaches. So uh, unless I'm getting it wrong, you know, isn't that how we see it? Or how might we explain that to someone? I think that's a super, super important point, um, because it's not when Jesus sees his faith, the singular man on the bed, he sees their faith. Um, He sees the faith of, and I think you can include, you know, in our heads, at least I usually picture five total people here, one on each corner of the bed and the man on the bed. Um, Uh Obviously, that's not a detail that's included. That's just the way I picture No, I always, but you know what's um, funny? I always picture two. Uh, you know, I just figure they're really strong, I suppose. I don't know. I, I never thought oh, about oh, the uh, mechanics of it. I see. More yeah, like but, but, but four makes sense. Yeah, anyway, go oh, ahead. That's interesting. <laughs> but he's seeing, he's not just seeing the faith of the man on the bed. And, and grammatically, it does allow for the possibility that he's only talking about the faith of those who are carrying the bed. Well, and that's and the that part is, that's, that's a, a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. That's a challenging thing to kind of wrap our minds around. And I think the, the easier reading in terms of uh, using the rule of faith to, to interpret the scriptures, right, that, that we see throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, no one is saved by someone else's faith. Um, no, one is, no one is forgiven for the sake of someone else and so on. Um, I think it's easier to just include all three or five or however many there were. Um, that he sees everyone's faith, but that he's also recognizing because this man cannot bring himself to Jesus, he's recognizing the important role that is played by the faith of those who carried him. Because without them, and without them trusting that Jesus can do what Jesus is about to do, then, then how does this paralytic ever come before Jesus? I think there's an important parallel uh, to be found in baptism. Uh, oh, particularly yeah. infant baptism that, that, you know, that infant, and we can talk about the faith of infants perhaps another time, um, but that infant cannot bring himself to Jesus. He cannot bring himself to the font that relies in large part on the faith of the parents uh, and sometimes the faith of the grandparents and the faith of the great grandparents and the aunts and the uncles and all of that, um, you know, there that it very much relies on the faith of others to make this thing happen. Um, I, it's for this reason, actually, this is the basis of, um, this is, this is my, uh, proof text for the way that I treat, um, those who do not commune at the communion rail, uh, when they come up, I, I do invite people who are not receiving communion to come forward. And if they are children who are not yet confirmed or not yet receiving the Lord's supper, uh, when I commune their parents, I absolve the children individually sure, of course. Uh, who are at the rail for this reason. Um, yeah. Because that child, right, who is not receiving the Lord's Supper, nevertheless, I know that that child has faith. And I know that their parents in faith are bringing them to the rail because that's where Jesus is. And so, you know, in, in a sense, I'm seeing the faith of that whole household and forgiving sins um, for the parents or for the older children in the household, it's with the body and blood of Jesus. And for those who are not yet instructed, uh, then it's it's simply with the words of the absolution. Um, but I think, you know, when you kind of take that whole thing, right, Jesus is not just looking into the heart of one person here. He's seeing kind of the whole, kind of a household, if you will, the man and his friends. Uh, and I think we do the same thing when we when we bring God's gifts to entire households even though those gifts, depending on maturity of faith and level of instruction and all those kinds of things that we've set up in the meantime in the church on earth, uh, those gifts look different. But we are still bringing Jesus to those people. Or in this case, uh, the friends are bringing uh, this paralyzed man to Jesus. The last thing I might mention here is uh, that you can and should, Christians, bring your prayers with you to the communion rail and Uh, If we really do believe that the pastor stands in the stead and by the command of Jesus, bring those people with you who are weighing on your heart, those people who should be in church with you, but for whatever reason are not, those who are stuck at home, those who are in the hospital, those who are rebelling against the faith and who are choosing not to come because they're refusing to believe X, Y, and Z, bring them with you to the communion rail where Jesus is and leave those people at Jesus' feet. 
bring them in your prayers and leave them with the one man who can heal them. I was wondering where you're going to go with that. And it's such a compelling image. I mean, earlier on, yeah, if you did not see parents carrying their children to the waters of baptism, then yeah, you're not paying attention. That's just such a clear message. But you've definitely amplified it in a way that's uh, we're just, I just love it. I mean, it, we are in a church community, not because we are saved by the faith of others, but because of just how important being in community with others of faith are for the, the, the bolstering of our faith, for bringing up our children, for spreading the gospel. So in that way, um, and, and I've got to be very technical here, but in that way, you know, you are saved by other people's actions. Now, again, don't crop that out on its own because that will get me in trouble. I mean, God <laughs> does all the work. God does all the work, but he does his electing work through us. And he does his uh, uh, bolstering of faith through means, through the word and sacraments. And those things have to be, well, uh, proclaimed and administered. Um, and so I, I think you're right. This is just an amazing picture of the church. And frankly, um, kind of in a, even an almost clearer, cathartic way than just, say, Paul's letters where they're, he's, he's just telling us, this again lends to that power of story. We see not just a list of, you know, you're members of Christ and don't join your members with someone that's not Christ-like, but this is what it actually looks like. And for us, it may not be lifting someone down through the tiles of a roof to Jesus. It might be bringing our prayers and petitions to the altar during communion or really any other time. Um, it might be inviting our friends to church to hear the good news. It might be taking that good news to our friends who refuse to come to church. But yeah, through other people's faith, God does spread faith. It's, it's, it's the right kind of uh, infectious disease, if I can be a little, a little silly about it. Um, you know, faith spreads. So, you know, clear out the leaven so that you can be a new lump. That Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, I just, I love this text so much. It reminds me a lot of what Luther says in the Small Called Articles, where he refers to um, the mutual conversation and consolation of the brethren, and he calls it a right. means of grace. He doesn't call it a sacrament, but he does call sure. it a means of grace, a means by which God's gifts are given to his faithful. Uh, and that's that's really a remarkable thing. So, you know, sometimes as Christians, we we wake up on Sunday morning and I'm I'm more than willing to confess as a pastor. I've woken up on Sunday morning before and thought, no, I don't really want to get up today because uh, <laughs> some days are like that. It's not unique to Sunday. Uh, sometimes it happens to be a Sunday and we're just we're not really feeling it. We're not really sure that we want to go to church. We have to drive there. We have to sit through the sermon. We have to do all these things. We're just not really no, nah, don't really feel like it. Uh, Christians on days that that happens to you, don't go for you. Go for somebody else. Go for somebody oh, else who yeah. needs the consolation and the conversation, who will be encouraged by the fact that there's one more person in church this week than there was last week. Go for somebody else that day. Pray for them. Pray for you. Just be there. Just be part of the body of Christ. And God will bless you for being there. Even if it's not for you, maybe he blesses somebody else through you this week. So, Pastor, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? <laughs> what, what, what? Jesus is obviously being very intentional with his language here. You, you mentioned already authority. I think we understand what's getting the church leaders amazed and in awe and maybe even a little upset. But why does Jesus use that language of your sins are forgiven instead of just rise and walk? Yeah, this is incredible. Uh, I've heard this interpreted lots of different ways. And I'm frankly, I'm sympathetic to a lot of different kinds of kinds of interpretations. And I think there's room for a lot of overlap here. Um, but it's, it's really interesting, I think, that the Pharisees and the scribes say, who can, who has the power, that's that same power word, who has the power to forgive sins, but God alone. And that's correct. They're right. Nobody has the power. No one's actually able to work actual forgiveness of sins except God himself. That's true. But which is easier? Your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? And I think the gut instinct is, obviously, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. And to see, perhaps, results immediately. Um, not tangible. You can't look at sins being forgiven unless we're looking at Christ crucified. Uh, 
but if I say to my children, I forgive you, or my wife says to me, I forgive you, uh, we don't get to watch that happen, but we do get to experience right. the good result of that right away. On the other hand, saying rise and walk from the human perspective, I mean, it's easy enough to say those words, but it's impossible to make them actually do something. Uh, and so I think from Jesus' perspective, the easier thing is to say rise and walk. Because if he is the author of life, if he designed and created everything in the universe, including humanity itself in his image and likeness, simply restoring that creation to the way that he built it is, is actually not probably terribly difficult for him. On the other hand, forgiveness of sins. Now that really costs something throughout the Old Testament. There is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And so to, to really grab onto which one costs more, well, the forgiveness of sins is what costs more. It costs Jesus his entire life. Um, so to say rise and walk, it's, it's almost, this is a bad analogy, um, but it's almost like going to a, to a physician and which one's going to be easier for the physician to set and heal a broken arm or for that physician to remove the sinful condition which led to the fallen creation right. which caused you to break your arm in the first place. I well, actually now think one that's of a... them seems one <laughs> of them seems way easier than the other one, right? And well, from, I think that's actually think a pretty Jesus. apt analogy because oftentimes physicians, and this is no dig on physicians, but because of just their limited ability to see into the, the actual core problem of a person, they often typically treat symptoms rather than the core cause. Um, and, and sometimes that's just all you can do. So I, I, I kind of see that. And I, I also see here, too, that that Jesus says your sins are forgiven, and I love this context that you're putting it in. It's much, much harder to say that. Also, to say rise and walk is immediately evident, as we've talked about. Um, he chooses that to show that if I can make someone walk, then the other part, you, you kind of have to trust that is it's also going to be true. He's looking forward to something that hasn't happened yet. But the other thing I want to make sure people know is that the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're not unfamiliar with the concept of a human being authorized by God telling people they're forgiven. I mean, they they understand that there would be uh, sacrifices or there would be ablutions or there would be something by which people would seek God's forgiveness and then they would be in that position to help effect that. So it wasn't just that some guy is saying your sins are forgiven and that's awful. It's just what our dear guest has been saying. That is, to just forgive without the shedding of blood is is a blasphemy, and especially to speak by your own authority and say that your sins are forgiven. And I only bring that up because, well, brother, you and I forgive people their sins all the time, and, and Christians themselves, uh, you know, not even the clergy, but you know, other Christians are called to forgive others their sins when they sin against you. So it's not blasphemous to pronounce forgiveness. The, 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 the seeming blasphemy here is that Jesus is able to do that without the shedding of blood. But as we know, that's on its way. Yeah. I mean, I think some of the, some of the most important words that we as pastors say, and hopefully some of the most important words that our, that our congregations grab onto week in and week out are in the stead and by the command, right? To remember that we have been given authority to say those words, and that authority is honored before God in heaven. Your sins really are forgiven when your pastor pronounces the absolution. Uh, but we don't have that power. Only God has the power. And I think that's the difference, right? Now, Jesus is showing, he's saying to the Pharisees, I think kind of implied, you're right, only God has the power to forgive the sins. <laughs> yeah, I guess look, who I am. <laughs> that's me. That's me. <laughs> I've been right. given that authority even on earth. I have come, well, and you know, come down out of heaven, so to speak, to be able to do that even on earth. That's part of the reason I'm sent. Right. And that's it. They're, they're basically saying, gosh, he couldn't do that unless he was God. And then they don't take the next step to say, oh, he must be God. Well, you would hope, brother, that as people leave, when the sacrament is, is, is administered rightly, the word is proclaimed, forgiveness is dispensed, you'd hope that people would leave worship saying, we have seen extraordinary things today, but it doesn't always happen. We kind of get used to all the blessings God gives us, but, well, unfortunately, we're out of time. 
But we've heard extraordinary things today, and I'm very grateful to our guest for helping unpack them for us. He's been the Reverend Roger Mullet, pastor of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Buffalo, Wyoming. We're out of time, buddy, but thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me again. Always a joy. Hey, folks, tomorrow, Pastor Timothy Sandino comes on to wrap up Luke chapter 5. We'll study Jesus' calling of Levi, the tax collector. And this Friday, it's our free text First Friday episode. And being the day after Independence Day, our topic's going to be freedom. Not secular freedom, but we'll focus on what it means to be free in Christ and the concept of Christian freedom. So you're not going to want to miss that. That's with Pastor William Swirla. Until then, though, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.